Okay, welcome back. Uh, and now we will uh, kick, uh, start the workshop. And uh, John and Vinet will uh, hand uh, the workshop part. And please, John, uh, have an introduction of what we will do in the couple of coming hours. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Mika. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to the workshop. Uh, this is the part where I will not talk so much. We will actually get you involved and uh, utilize your expertise and your knowledge. So um, my name is John Sandberg. Uh, I work at Ericsson Research. Um, I work quite a lot with the guys in, in LTU, with Wiebke and, and Vinit and David. Um, the last uh, five, six years, I have actually mainly worked with non-traditional telecom operator kind of customers, trying to understand the new markets. Um, uh, we want to understand on how Ericsson can expand into new areas. Uh, so I'm working quite a lot with uh, other industrial partners like Volvo, uh, ABB, mining companies, manufacturing companies, process industries, which is um, really interesting. And business models is obviously a, a key area there. And it, it, it's kind of funny because I'm, I'm coming from Ericsson, we basically, we focus a lot on wireless, of course. And if you look at me now, it doesn't look so, so much wireless. Uh, so this is the, the, the workshop today. And, and the purpose is, is really to get together and really engage uh, in discussions. We want to sh you to share experiences between each other. We want you to sort of put hard questions on the table. So the workshop will work like this. I will do give some sort of introduction to, to the area and, and, and sort of give you some ideas. Then we will divide ourselves into four groups and I will, will, will provide you some, some inputs on who goes into what group. We will have two parts. The first part of the workshop is to, together in the group, select one sort of industry scenario and pick out five key challenges you see with regards to business modeling in a multi-actor uh, scenario. We have not too much time, so we need to be really efficient. Quickly come up with these five challenges. You will write them on the whiteboard over there, and we will have a quick, uh, quick pitch from each team uh, that, that sort of talks about these challenges and what you mean with them. Then we will have some, uh, a short selection, so each team will then be assigned to go into the group discussion again and discuss how can we solve one of these challenges? What kind of methodologies? What kind of engagement models? What kind of tool sets can we use? Way of working together? Or in a broad scale, how can we sort of address these issues? And then we'll do some wrap up. Okay? I will give you some more guidance later on. But just some introduction from, from the perspective where I stand and where Ericsson stand today and, and what we see the largest challenges here in this, uh, in this area. I mean, it, there's a lot of, of talking about in the, uh, industrial Internet of Things, Internet of Things, Industry 4.0, and it all sort of boils down to the things we have heard others talk about earlier this morning. It's about servitization, moving towards from a product-centric uh, economy to a service-centric economy and the challenges that come out of that. The digitalization is sort of the, the, in the center, of course, of, of Internet of Things. You move to the online economy. And all of this has effects on, 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 on how you, and you need to transfer your business models. And in fact, what, what, what really happens is, what we see is that, that, that business models get linked between the actors in a stakeholder network. We, we work a lot, of course, with communication services and Internet of Things, sort of the foundation of that is that you have a connectivity, you have a communication service in the bottom. But if you go as a company and, and want to start delivering digital services to your companies, to your customers, and you have to rely on a communication service, you want to have a service provider for that also, your business models get 
more, much more interlinked than before. And there are some challenges to that. And, and in the end, we end up in much more complex uh, stakeholder networks. So this is, this is sort of the scenarios uh, uh, we want, I want you to work with in, in the workshop. And just to give you an example, in one of the projects I work on right now, um, that is a Vinova-sponsored project called PIM, we have this kind of, of really complex stakeholder network. It's in the mining context. The mining company over there, they want to have as few inter interfaces as possible. They want to buy services from machine vendors, control system vendors, and, and so forth. But if, you, if you're starting to move towards selling um, results or outcome-based value propositions, let's take the example that we're working with, uh, uh, with ABB around smart ventilation. If you want to take that step towards uh, really taking control over uh, the air and, and move towards a, a value proposition where you actually sell air quality instead of, of products and services around that. That's a, a quite big steps. And uh, as, as Vibke was talking about, there's a certain amount of risk that comes into this. And you need to manage that. You need to have a local contractor probably at, at, uh, at, at this spot, which is a big sort of cost issue. You need to rely on, 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 on a communication network. And if you're a global player, you don't want to have 700 operators that you have an, an, an interface with. You would like to have one global operator. And it's, if someone steps on in and take that role, that means that that risk of handing all the 700 moves to a new player. So this kind of, of, of things is happening is the ends what we see when you get multi-actors in. Because if you are to deliver the full value to your customer, you're relying on several others in a, in a, in a, in a different setup than from the, when you have a product uh, sales. OK? So back to the workshop then. As I said, we will divide into four groups. You can stay here, you can go outside, have a discussion. Uh, we will, uh, around 20 minutes, that's the, all the time we have. And within those 20 minutes, you should have also have the time to list your five key challenges here. I will provide sort of a, a, a spot, spot for each group. And then you, in the group, you assign uh, someone who is the sort of leader or the secretary or whatever you want to call it, they can do a short pitch also. Uh, then, then me, Vinit, and Sophie will, will help out in, in, in selecting some uh, challenge to, to focus further on and, and look into s how to, to solve that challenge. Okay? This is the first time we, r we run this workshop, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, it, it's, uh, you're, you're the guinea pigs here. Uh, and then after, after that, you come back and we, we, we discuss a bit more about the, your proposal for how to, to actually handle that. So these are the groups. Each group will be sort of accompanied by a service researcher that can help you sort of being a catalyst in your discussion if you get stuck and so on, because we have so limited time right now, right? And if someone do, do not find your name, uh, just pick one group. It's as easy as that, okay? Now it's going to be super interesting to hear what you have sort of done. I mean, we can start in order here with group one. So what, what was the sort of, what was the industry scenario you picked and, and how did you discuss and come up with these challenges? And we will clock you, so three minutes maximum you have yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> Time to you. Yeah. My name is uh, Katarina Limmefeldt and I'm from ABB. And we talked about um, the 
the opposites here, product and services. Because many times the organization is focused on product and then there is an island or a pipe between service and product. That's very much a challenge. And then if we go back to Janne Karlsson at SAS, the moment of truth is not actually when we package the product in our delivery center, it's actually once it's diagnosed, diagnosified or delivered at the end customer. And maybe that's totally uncontrollable because maybe it's a partner, maybe it's a channel to market. They need to be trained and they need to understand the value and they are the moment of truth when we, if we are successful or not. Oh, we, we thought of Volvo, for example, sell, selling cars, but now it's a matter of selling transport system instead. Uh, and we started to figure out uh, some challenges. And, and one uh, would, would be that, well, uh, we don't see the map of what is happening here. So how could we discover value or new value in the kind of interplay between actors? How is that process uh, uh, going on then. If, if the car is a status marker, then if you instead rent the car, uh, then how is, is this the status value of cars? Uh, what, what is its threat, threatened then? And other type of values are coming up uh, then. But when you change the business model, what kind of value will you get out of uh, different parties in that new model? If that changes, it kind of disrupts the, the given setup that you have today, but still you can't keep that. You need to move into something new, but how do you do that without upsetting uh, what you have today and uh, actually have the two working together, which is uh, one of the, uh, Vipke talked about that as well. How do you actually manage these two ones? Are you actually only component in the system or do you actually run the system? If you take Uber, for example, they own the system, they don't own the cars, they don't own the drivers, they don't employ them. They, they run the platform. Thing. Exactly. The platform and they is the dictate value. who can be in that system. <coughs> right. I think it's quite interesting that we have kind of the same discussions in our group, even though we had another perspective. And uh, one thing we thought about in this uh, platform is how to uh, see the revenue stream, uh, both from the customer side and also from the suppliers. How can we also tell the customers that they are making money? And how can we also address the suppliers that they are making money? So the revenue stream in the in the business model. And then we also talked about educating the customers. Krista talked about, uh, what was it, internet mafia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, that kind of behavior can happen, uh, although in B2B setting it is less likely to, but, uh, you know, so it right. would be interesting to know how to really manage that. Yeah. The, 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 the selection board is now me, basically, since you were in one of the teams, and Sophie had to step out for a meeting. <laughs> but I think that w what I found really interesting here, I mean, uh, all of the things are obviously challenges and interesting, but, but how do you actually find, how do you identify the new buying center in the customer's uh, organization? I think that, that, that would be something to, to have a bit more discussions around, and, and, and so, so that, that will be my selection there. I think we, we will start this time, we will give the opportunity to group four to start. Um, so let's see what you have uh, come up with as solutions to how to manage new revenue streams. We face customer that has capex, capex constraints and um, the unwillingness to invest and the problems they do tend to have to uh, have an investment approvals. So we face more questions like rental and leasing and paper use. Like we have, we have looked a lot of on the business models for Rolls Royce. We discussed that. Mm -hmm. You actually have the Internet of Things. You maintain the jet engines. You have a lot of benefits 
and efficiency for providing spares and so on. So did you discuss this, this sort of um, having the upfront investment to sort of mitigate risk uh, of, of, uh, and getting some money early to cover some of the cost and then have the recurring revenues, right? And we also have had this discussion about equipment that tend to last too long compared to the risk. And if you own the equipment, you actually have a, a possibility to enforce a change of generation in the equipment. Right. The main question, how do you go from A to B, getting into the new, without actually leaving A? And it, we come back to this question earlier, that how do you manage two different business models at the same time? Co connected to your value chain. You're moving from a value chain into an ecosystem setup. How does the roles uh, change if you go from A to B, but at the same time maintain what you had before? How do you manage that? You create that setup. Did you discuss um, the, the, the differences whether you're a new player into a, new va into a value network or if you're an, a current actor in a value network? No, we didn't. We, we said that uh, you need to develop the whole value chain. When you go upwards in the value chain, you need to kind of bring everything with you and, and see how it changes. And so everybody feels that their role is clear in the value chain. Right. Get a piece of the... I, I'm trying to contemplate a little bit the part of this multiple business model. So yeah. we typically say that each company has one core business model, yeah. which in this case is product oriented for mo all of us, and then we add services to it. Mm -hmm. Are we really talking about that Volvo will only sell you know, customers' availability contracts in future, even for a small farmer. Uh, I don't think so. No. So then we are kind of thinking about uh, maybe two business models, yeah. uh, that's true. which probably will be dependent on contingencies, right? One would be preferred over another, depending upon the customer need in some way. But then you get down to how do you afford a portfolio set up yes. for, for direct sales versus this contract-based model more or less, mm. which is how do you get to a place where you're actually profitable, yes. where this adds to the other instead of kind of takes away. Yeah. Takes away yeah. right. One comment here, I think right. uh, it's interesting with uh, what we're talking about, more and more linked uh, business models and, and their conflict with them and so on. I think it's also good to think about uh, the, the value network and, yeah. and think about the value net uh, value model. For, for, for the whole uh, network, I think. So, so, and then some, some part or, or all the par parties need to consider also what is the value model uh, that is working for the whole network. Then I think it's more viable. Then we discussed a little bit around what is the map actually? How can we, what kind of tool is it? Is it a cloud-based tool uh, where we, uh, analyze lots of data, bring it into this tool and, 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 and get some sort of uh, response back from that data and uh, we can draw conclusions based on that. Or someone said uh, that uh, behind this theory is there, is there is a lot of, you know, we could describe it as uh, when you compose music, you know, you need to visualize, you need to see, you need to listen, you need to understand, instead of just digging into to, to the details immediately, you need to, 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 to get some sort of a bigger picture. And what are the uh, gains and pains the end customer has? And based upon that, you can start thinking about what would be a gain creator or a pain reliever. And when you understand that, you can also think about the value chain of providing this for helping the customer to get the end customer job done, where is the value provided? That can be a help for you to create your own value propositions. And that, when you do that job, you might need to understand that customer needs something which you cannot totally provide by yourself. And then you are very lucky if you're part of a network like Automation Region where you have so many competent people delivering different things. So that's when you can cooperate in your network. And maybe you can then agree upon
kind of kind of a common business model for these value propositions and you understand how the different networking partners come into the picture when delivering this. Okay. Thanks a lot, everyone. Seems like we had some really good discussions and uh, and started to dig into some deeper questions and uh, into this area that is is of course super big and super hard. And I, I don't know how many of, of you here is is in engineers in, in sort of by heart. I think most of us somehow are. And and these business model discussions. And I see them every time in all the, the projects we do, whether it's Vinova financed or it's a bilateral discussions with, with partners and customers. Oh, but we need to look into the business model, someone says. And I come to realize that that, that means many things. I mean, it's sort of a common denominator for everything that does not have to do with technology. Um, so, so it's m many different things, but I think uh, I think the workshop worked out quite good. I mean, the the main purpose was to get get the discussions going, share knowledge and share experiences. And I think if I would try to summarize the the the, the work from the groups, I mean, m most of you came back to sort of the basics. We we we, we sort of tried to paint out this specific area of, of, of multi-actor business models and how, how that puts additional challenges. But it, it, it tells me that, that we still have a lot to do with the basics of going from product to services and the business model uh, transformation that happens from that. Um, another thing that, that, that I think is, is really interesting and, and that also showed that, that we don't really came up with a good solution to it here, but, but it's something that is uh, uh, recognized that needs to be handled, and that is the, the move. When you, when you sort of are in a value network and you want to move further higher up in the value uh, chain, if you like, and then you st still want to keep your current business with, with some other customer, in this value network, how, how do you sort of navigate in that? that that's not an easy task. Um, and, and then we, we, we had quite a lot of discussions also around understanding the complexity of the value network as such is, is sort of something you, you first need to do. And, 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 uh, to grasp that, and, in, and it very much comes to a maturity question in the end. The need to sort of visualize this, to get everyone, and I, I think that's the, what I see in many of the, the interactions with, with par new partners and, and, and customers, is that we don't even speak the same language. So we speak about the same thing, but call them different things, which means that we adopt we don't have the bigger picture, as, uh, as the, what someone said here. We need to set the, the bigger picture first and, and, and have some common ground on where we are going. Because it's very easy that we start getting into the details directly. And you, you lose each other. You, 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 you don't meet in the discussion. And, and that was something that all the teams also highlighted very strongly, the, the need for collaboration. You, ne you cannot do this on your own. You cannot sit and create your business model and just give that to your customer. You need to create that together. And, and in, in, to, to sort of finalize, you must understand the customer. There is no shortcut. There is no shortcut. I mean, in, in a product scenario, you have a, a, a strong product with a long feature list that, ha that do all fancy kind of stuff. And you manage to squeeze that to the customer and say, OK, it's on your own risk now. Do what you want with that. I managed to sell it to you. Good. That's not how it happens with services at all. And I think the, the, the final touch here is, is uh, you, you pointed at Osterwald as, as, as a tool set to use for visualizing, to gather around. And I, I think we have been using that quite a lot also from, from Ericsson. And, and it, even if that is a rather simple tool as such, how to use it and how to really 
get value out of that in the collaboration with the customer is not so easy. So it's, it's, it's easy to understand the tool as such. Uh, and it's also powerful too once you get people to start understanding it and know it. Thanks a lot, everyone, for very good discussions. And I, uh, again, I want to stress that that was the main purpose, to get you discussing and share knowledge. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.